All right. So again, my name is Mike. If you guys have any questions, make sure to put them in the questions box whenever they come up. I will go out of my way to make sure I can answer those. Otherwise, at the end of this, I will have some time for you guys to uh, to ask questions. So again, we're going to go over a few things that they're pretty big and a lot of you guys probably know how to use them, but uh, maybe not using them correctly or maybe a different way that you could be using something. So the first thing I want to talk about as I was coming up with this little example for my advanced holes, uh, I realized it was a good time to use groups inside the layers. And so groups inside the layers are just so you could group together layers or, or yeah, layers that are similar to each other. So in this case, what I'm going to do is for me to use this advanced holes feature like I plan on using here in a few minutes. <clears throat> I need points for all of these arcs that are on the screen. So what I what I want to do is separate these. So I'm going to start by making a new layer. And I'm just going to call this quarter 20 holes. And I'm going to put my check mark on it. And then I have some 3 eighths holes. So I'm going to add another one, say 0.375 through holes. All right, these quarter 20s, those are tapped because they're quarter 20s. And then I'll add another one. These are half inch through holes. All right. So the first thing I want to do is I would just want to take the geometry and move it to the correct layer. So I'm going to hide my solid and I'm going to go and pick. Here's my four quarter 20s right here. I'm just going to right click, modify attributes, layer, and I'll put that on the quarter 20 holes. Then I can go ahead and hide that layer. And actually, I could turn off all the other layers for now just so that I can pick these and then just automatically move them and they'll blank out. So here's my three eighths holes. So again, modify attributes, layer, three eighths through, okay. And then finally the half inch. So layer, half inch through holes. Now, when we have that done, again, we need points for all of these. So what I can do is I can create the points or I could create the layer and then move things. What I'm gonna go and do is right here, I'm going to add a new group. And this group is labeled as group number five. And I'm just gonna call this the quarter 20 uh, holes and points. Now I don't actually need the holes, uh, but I do wanna leave them there for now. Now to add a layer that you've already created into a group, you just grab the layer and drag it. You just grab the layer, there we go. Hold on, I'm reorganizing things. You just grab the layer you want and move it to the group you want. So let me move my holes layer back up here. Oh, I accidentally put that in there. So as you can see right here, I just made a mistake and I accidentally grabbed both of these layers somehow when I was doing this um, and put them both inside this folder. And you can see as I collapse it, it's there. Now, since the holes isn't supposed to be there, what I could do is just hit this button right here, the move out button and move it back out. And I can actually move that back up to where it was. So now I have my quarter 20 hole layer, and now I'm gonna go in and add a new layer to that group. All right, and you can tell it's part of that group when you, when you expand and, and uh, collapse it. So this layer is gonna be quarter dash 20 points. And I'm gonna make sure my check marks on it. Go up to create 2D point, and then I'm going to use this button right here, point from entities. I'm going to uncheck the endpoint option, and I'm just going to drag a box over those four points and hit OK. And now what we'll see is I can actually turn off the points and the holes individually. But if I shrink up the group, I can actually turn the whole group off as whenever, you know, whenever I don't need it. So I can turn the whole thing on or the whole thing off. So now we'll go ahead and make another group. This is going to be the .375 through holes and points. And again, we're just gonna grab our 3 eighths through holes there and drag it down into that layer. And as you can see, we can expand and collapse it. And then I'll do one more group real quick. Uh, make sure I don't put that group inside of another group because you can do that. And so I just wanna go from here, I'll say add a group. And this is gonna be my half inch through holes and points. All right, so we separate all that stuff out and then we drag this one into that layer. So again, I could then right click on the actual group itself and add a new layer. And this is gonna be the 0.375 through hole 
points. And then I'm going to do the same thing for the half inch. So add a new layer to that group. Half inch. It should be down in here right there. Through hole points. Whoops, didn't, wasn't typing. Through hole points. And then there we have it. So now again, we just use the layers just like normal, except the difference is now I can hide and, and show different layers based on what's showing, just, just the whole group. So I have the through holes layer showing. I need to still make sure that my green check mark is on the correct um, layer. Yeah, on the correct layer. So now I'll go in, I'll do my points once again. Hit OK. And so we'll see, we can hide the arcs and we can hide the holes separate. And, or we could hide and show the entire group. And then finally, we'll just turn on the half inch through holes, put our check mark on the points hole, uh, the points layer there, and hit OK. So now what we have is everything kind of set up. So we have our solid. If I go ahead and shrink this up, we could actually turn on each grouping. And now that's something that I don't typically do. This is totally up to you if you decide to use groups. Um, so far, I've used them just a, just a handful of times. The last time I used them was uh, on a job where I was doing three different barrels for a, uh, for a Glock. I had a Glock 17, Glock 17L, and a Glock 34. And so what I was able to do with that is take the barrel and I, the guy that was making them didn't know exactly which one he wanted to use. So he took the barrel, put it on a layer or made a group for it. So we made a, a you know Glock 17 group and then we had the solid inside the group and then we had the wireframe for that group also inside that group. And it's just super handy to be able to turn things on and off quickly. If I don't want to see any of the holes, I just turn the whole group off. If I want just the points, I can turn on just the points, and that's what we're going to use. So this should be the same, but over here I have my advanced holes. It's already done, same exact thing. Uh, what I want to do now is machine this. So I'm just going to right-click, New Job. We're going to do our mill 3-axis or our BC3X mill, and then we'll just go to the stock wizard. All right, so we have multiple ways of going and defining this thing. We could go in and pick the, you know, just pick the holes and then go and set it ourselves or what the real plan is. Let me just see if I can do that. Calculate stock, yeah. So the Y axis will be our extrusion direction. Our top will be here and we wanna go four inches wide. So we'll say calculate. Uh, there it is. Okay, so top is at, that's at zero, so top two. And then is that there? Hold on. There we go. So that made the wireframe stock, so we don't have to machine it away. And then for the origin, I'll just use top dead center. I'm just going to lift it up a couple inches in Z for my simulation. If you guys have the Machine Simulation Pro, you'll want to lift your, uh, your geometry up for the virtual machine. Otherwise, don't worry about it. And there we go. So technically at this point, we are done. We're ready to go. We're, we're ready to start machining this. The problem is I have to define everything at this point going through the features, which is how we've usually, you know, that's how most of you guys would probably do this anyway. It's, how the, it's the method I would use probably for the most part. But there's a feature in here that a lot of people overlook. And then some features don't really work uh, on it anymore. So I just want to show you guys the advanced holes. It's under Create 3D here, and you just go to Advanced Holes. Now, the geometry that you're picking when you do advanced holes is the points that are in the middle of the arcs, not the actual arcs themselves. So by default, this is set up for a hole, has a diameter of a half inch. It's got the tip angle included, so you have the angle of the tip. And then you can go in and set your depths. Now, the way we pick this is just by picking the points on top of the part. So in my case, this is a through hole. So if I make this any distance thicker than the rest of my part and it goes all the way through, this drill tip on the bottom doesn't matter. But if I was doing blind holes, you would actually have the drill tip on the bottom. So what I'm saying with this is by picking that point, I want to create a hole that has a diameter of a half inch goes a depth of two and a half inches or 2.65. But you could also go in here and define that there's a chamfer on top of the hole. All right, and you can tell what the top diameter is and the angle. Or a counter bore 
on top of the hole or a powder bore chamfer. So you can actually do them all at the same time. Now, the benefit of setting up your holes this way is we have that hole recognition feature inside of the uh, cam tree. So I'm just going to go ahead and hit OK real quick. And that's going to put the first two holes in. Now, the next ones are also just through holes. So I'll go 0.375. And with this one, I'm going to turn off all the other layers. And then I'm going to expand the group and I'm going to hide the holes for that layer. And you'll see once again, looking at this selection mask, it's not trying to pick solids. It's just trying to pick points. So by separating this geometry onto separate layers, it makes it a lot easier for me to be able to come in and pick this. And there it is. So now we have a 3 8 hole on the top right there. Uh, you could go in and put your chamfer, but then it's going to try and put a chamfer tool. It really depends on how you guys chamfer your holes. If you're just going to use like a spot drill and go a little deeper, I wouldn't include that in here. Uh, just because when we go to use the hole recognition feature, it won't find that little chamfer. Uh, or it'll find it and try and add a tool to it. So it's more work than I need to do. So there's my through hole. But again, you could add a chamfer or a counterbore. And then the last one here, I can go into my thread and I can choose my quarter 20. And it automatically sets the information for this. I can turn on my quarter 20 holes. And I'm just going to go ahead and turn off the holes themselves. So I just have the points. Drag a box over the whole thing. And this is now going to be set up as a tapped hole. Now we'll hit OK. Cancel out. And we now have all of our geometry pretty much done. So I'm going to hide everything else but the model itself. Now, I've already created the stock, and I used wireframe stock to do it. And now what I'm going to go and do is drill, you know, drill and tap and do all of these holes. So to do this, we right-click on Machine Setup 1, and the third option down is Hole Recognition. Now, again, this works best if the holes were created in Bobcad because it now has all the information for the holes. So we select the whole body, pick the solid model, and then right down here, you can tell it to set a minimum hole diameter to look for and a maximum hole diameter. I have had a couple times where I have a radius in a corner that happens to match a drill that I'm already using. So it actually will group that in with it. Um, so that's still something you, you got to deal with. You could deselect that corner when you're done. But the max hole diameter would be if there's a big hole on your part, that goes all the way through there's sometimes bobcad sees that as a through hole and i've had it try and drill you know two inch and three inch pockets when really you know i'm i'm gonna pocket that thing i, I don't want to drill it but it'll go and pick a three inch drill and try and drill it it's uh you know crazy expensive tooling but uh it does do it so i'm gonna go ahead and just pick the model here and then hit okay and that's going to pull up this page here. So we can see we have our half inch diameter, we have our three eighths diameter, and we have our quarter inch diameter. It also read the top of the part, <clears throat> excuse me, so it knows where it starts and it knows how deep to go. So you'll see the top of the half inch holes is at zero here, and we're going two inches deep through the part. That's perfect. The three, eight, uh, three eighths holes, they're starting a half inch down, and then they're going an inch and a half deep. And then my quarter inch holes are starting at minus one and they're just going one inch deep. And you can see right here, it did pick them as a hole, a hole and a tap hole because of how we defined them. If I had gone in and just cut holes through for everything, like the quarter 20 or maybe use the extrude cut like we've all done before, it'll read the holes, but it won't know that that hole specifically is tapped. So that's what you got to deal with. So. When you're done, you can either hit OK or you can hit Compute. Now, if you hit Compute or OK, it doesn't really matter. Most of the time, I have to end up going back through this feature to fix any problems. The center drill is probably not right, and that's partially my fault. Uh, it's mostly my fault. If I wanted to pick the right center drill, what I should have done was put a, you know, I use spot drills for everything. So I should have gone and put my half-inch spot drill in the tool crib before I did my hole recognition. That way it would have found the, the center drill that I planned on using. Another thing you'll notice is everything gets grouped together. So here's our two half inch holes up top. Here's our three eighths holes right here. And our clearance plane currently is only set to 200 thousandths, or sorry, our, our rapid plane is currently only set to 200 thousandths. So what that means for us 
is if I was to let this run, and you can actually see it right there, and another one right down there, that tool to get to the next hole is going to go right through the part. So we're going to fix that. We're going to fix our center drill. You know, basically double check the entire thing. Um, it's the, really the biggest complaint I have about it is it's, you know, I, I have to go in and do work afterwards, but that's something I got to do anyway because I don't use Bobcat's feeds and speeds. So I'd have to come in and set up my feeds and speeds anyway uh, just to make it work. So right here's my half inch hole. I'm just going to right click on there first, say edit. And the benefit of doing it this way is most of the work is done. At this point, all I have to do is really kind of next through my features, you know, pick the center drill where, you know, the first time I see it. So I'll go to my tool crib uh, or sorry, tool library. I'm going to choose my half inch 90 degree spot and hit OK. And then I can hit OK again. And that's going to replace the center drill for this feature. But now that drill, that center drill is inside of our tool crib. So I'll be able to pick it up for the three eighths and the quarter inch uh, tap holes too. So again, feeds and speeds, you'd want to calculate them at this point. I use G-Wizard to do my calculations, and I'm not pulling up G-Wizard right now to figure this out. So I'm going to use the Bobcat feeds and speeds. We have our depth that we plan on cutting, and that's you could either define your center drill based off the depth you want to go, or you could define it based on the center diameter you want when the, when the center drill leaves. Uh, this is a half-inch hole and I'm using a half inch center drill. So there's no chance of putting a chamfer on it with this tool, but maybe I go up to a you know, three quarter inch spot drill or something. Then I'd be able to come in and say, I want a 0.52. And that's going to give you a 20 thousandths little chamfer on the top edge there. Uh, in my case though, I'm just going to say, let's go a hundred thousandths deep. That'll give me a center diameter at 200 thousandths. It's a 90 degree tool. So the math's really easy to figure out. And then right here, we have our cycle type as single depth. So one shot, pack, or fast pack. Whatever you want to use, you can use it. As far as the drill goes, Bobcat always just picks a drill that fits the hole. So it's, yeah, kind of irrelevant um, when you go to drill. So next, right here for the parameters, you'll see we have an effective depth of 2.05. But why is that 05 there? Our depth from the feature page back here was set to 2 because of this setting right here, this through hole option. If your hole is a through hole and you define it as a through hole, we will always add 50 thousandths onto the bottom of that drill so that we clear through the hole. And that's the effective depth. The overall depth is the distance that the tip of the tool is going to go down. And that's the number you're actually going to see inside your G code. That should be the number. The overall depth there would be the number you're going to see. So again, we have our single depth pack or fast pack. By default, the pecking is set to 50% of the tool diameter. So if I set my half inch drill, it's going to peck at a quarter of an inch, so half of that. Other than that, I'm done. I can just hit compute and move on to the next one. So on the next one, let me blank all this out. On the next one, we're going to first edit this. Uh, right here, we can see our grouping. And because those holes are grouped on the left side and the right side with a boss in the middle, what we actually have to do is break the whole group. Now, there's kind of two ways to go about this, and I've met guys that do a little bit of both. If I say break the whole group right here, it separates all eight of those holes into separate features. If I go and just hit compute at this point and look at the drill, we return to the clearance plane to go from one cut to the next instead of the rapid plane. So between these four holes, which could use the rapid plane, it's going to the clearance plane. It's wasting a lot of time. So what we want to do now is regroup these holes. We want to grab the four holes on the left and the four holes on the right. Now, the numbering can be a little weird, but you always get a preview of it right there. And you're just going to kind of click your way down the list. So you'll see one and two are on the left. Three and four or one, two and four are on the left. Five's not and six. So we need one, two, four, and six. A little tedious sometimes the way it breaks it down. But you pick all, all four holes that are on the left side and you say regroup holes. Then you go and pick all four holes that are on the right side, which should just be the ones that are left. Two seconds. Let me get this out of here. Uh, one second for adding text to comments in a video. I recorded the video. Uh, give me one second. Uh, there we go. 
Hold on, I just got to shut this whole thing down. Boom. Come on, guys, stop it. All right, let me shut this down. And where's the teams quit? Good. All right, so now I, I've got all the other four holes selected. So I'm just going to go and regroup those ones. So now we see group one. Point one is all the holes on the left. Group 1.3 is all the holes on the right. And so again, we'll go in real quick, swap out our center drill for the correct one. And that's all I'm really going to change. Unless you wanted to go with a chamfer on these. Let's chamfer them. So I have a 0.375 hole. I want a 20 thou chamfer. So we just have to add 0.02 to that. And that'll give us a little 39 five uh, rate or a uh, diameter at the top. So it should give us a little chamfer at the top for it. And again, you can choose to pack or fast pack, whatever you want to do. Now you do have to pay attention after you break something into a whole group. When you get to the parameters tab, you will have two separate groups. And I've made the mistake before of accidentally setting the depth for, for the first group. Maybe I'm overriding the depth that Bobcat chose. And I, I set the depth for the first group and I forgot to set the, the depth for the second group. So I ended up having one set of holes that was the right depth and then the other set that didn't go deep enough. Uh, but, you know, play around with it. And when I'm done, I can hit compute. And now what we'll see is instead of the drill going through the part, like we can see here on this uh, on this one still, it's now going four holes up, over, and then back down, cut the other four holes. So finally, we're onto the tap. Now, the tap is totally up to you. We have a it currently set up with a center drill, a drill, a chamfer drill, and a tap. Uh, the reason the chamfer drill's in there is because if I go up to my cam tab here and I go to my DMS defaults, that's our dynamic machining strategy defaults, if I go to my mill features and I go to my mill tap hole features or the templates and I look at the tap, the tap feature comes with a center drill, a drill, a chamfer and a tap. That's why we get that. If you never do a chamfer drill, you can actually go in and pick this uh, feature, this operation in this template and hit this little red X and it'll take it out and you'll never get that chamfer drill again. All right. Thanks, Al. Got it. All right, so I'm not going to delete it because that will ruin everything for me uh, for the future. I don't want to mess it up for my future stuff. So for me, I just usually go in, I'll get rid of the chamfer drill, and then I could go through my feature like normal. I do have to fix the whole grouping, but I'm just going to pick my center drill real quick. So there's that one. Uh, again, you could use it for a chamfer if you wanted to. I'm not going to. There's our 201 drill. I didn't define any of that. It's part of... It's just part of Bobcat. When you tell us you're doing a tap, we know what size drill to use. Uh, now, you may use another drill. You may use a different option. Uh, or or maybe you're doing a, a different size hole. If you guys ever look at G-Wizard, or I'm sure it's all over the place. Uh, but clearances for holes uh, is a big one. You know, maybe I don't want an exact 201. Maybe I want to go with like a 20, you know, like a 207 or something. And it'll just give me a, a, well, for that, it'll give me a smaller percentage of threads, uh, thread engagement. So you can play around with the drill, but remember, it's a drill. The tool path or the code between this 201 drill, and if I was to go put a half inch drill out at the machine, the code is the same. The depth that I'm cutting is the same. Um, so if you were to decide, you know what, I don't want to do a 201 or I broke my 201, I'm going to go the next size up or whatever. Um, you don't actually have to change anything in Bobcat other than the fact that your tool won't say the right name. Um, but you actually don't have to change anything in Bobcat because it's just updating or, or you're really just going to do the same thing with the same tool. Now, if you go much bigger, you know, if you were to pick a half inch tool, we do calculate the angle of the tip and add that amount on top or to the bottom of it, I guess, to the depth of it. So you do want to be careful with it, you know, but you got a little leeway with drilling, so use it as you need. Always go in and look at your depth that you're going with your drill, and then go look at the depth that you're going with your tap. Um, what you'll see is I'm currently going 1.05, and this is a through hole, so, so I have space below it. It's not a blind tap, 
But anytime you're doing blind tapping, make sure to double check the drill and the tap together. Because what a lot of people forget to account for is this ineffective number of threads here, or number of ineffective threads, where the tip of the tool has four ineffective threads. So for this quarter 20 tap, you can do the math real easy. You take your pitch and you multiply, multiply it by your ineffective number of threads. My pitch for a quarter 20 is 0.05. If you don't know your pitch, pull out your calculator. You have the number right there. It's a 20 thread per inch thing. So you just say one divided by 20, 50 thou is my pitch. So if I take that 50 thou and I times it by the number of ineffective threads, it's 200 thousands has to be added to get the full kind of thread cut. I'm not worried about on a part that's open at the bottom where we can thread through, uh, but on blind holes, you do have to account for that. So sometimes you got to send your drill a little deeper or make your thread a little shorter, whatever kind of works for you uh, in that situation. So. Uh, it's usually, you know, a couple, few thousands. Depends on what kind of part you're working on. And then finally, again, we get to our tap, and there is the settings for it. So we can go ahead and, well, first, let's go up to our machining strategy. Sorry, the feature tab. And we got to fix the group on this one. Luckily, there's only four holes, so we'll break the whole group. We got one and two both on the left. So we'll regroup those two. And then three and four, we'll regroup those two. You could also just go and change your rapid plane, and that might be an option I'd use for the like the three eighths holes, where they only had to go up an extra, you know, couple hundred thousands to clear that. Um, you could always just update update your rapid plane, but I find it better to break the whole group that way. When you're going from one group of holes to another, uh, you are you're lifting up to your clearance plane essentially. So now that we're done, we can hit compute and there it is. So we got our center drill, our drill and our tap. All right, so real simple, it's the hole recognition. It's a feature I, I like to use. I want them to, uh, I want them to build on it a bit more personally uh, and I'm hoping they do in the future. Uh, but a lot, a little bit of what I just dealt with could have been handled by me. Again, if I had gone in and put my center drill in the tool crib, and then came in and did the hole recognition, my center drill in the tool crib would have been the right one. But yeah, now we can see, we'll start the simulation. We'll just run through it real quick and see what it looks like. All right, I was playing with some options here. Let me turn my workpiece to show hide. And turn my stock to show. There we go. So again, it's just going to go in, do a center drill and a drill, center drill and drill, center drill, drill and tap. And you can see it's got the little chamfer on there. Now, one thing you could do for those of you that don't have a tool changer, I figure it's some of you guys, uh, you will not want to run it this way because I have a center drill, then I'm switching tools to my drill, then I'm going back to the center drill, then I'm going back to a drill. So I don't want to run it that way. Uh, especially if I'm the one that has to change all these tools. Uh, the way we can handle this is if you go up to right here, the machining order, or you right click on milling job and go to machining order, whichever way you use to get there, we have our setup right there. Now, individual feature is the setting that I have set as my default. And I like that one because I usually run parts based on the exact order that I set them up in the cam tree is the order I want them to run. That does a lot of times lead to more tool changes. The other option is go by individual tool or individual tool per, per machine setup, which really when you're only doing one machine setup, they do the same thing. And so this is gonna group the tools together based on which ones use, you know, kind of the order of the tools. So it's gonna do all of our center drills, then tool changes, but we do all of our drills and then finally the tap. So with that, now we'll see, we'll use our center drill. Give it a second to load. For everything. So we'll go in, run all the center drills, then the drills, then the drill and tap. So save you a little bit of time right there. All right, so we'll close that down. All right, so 
Uh, the next thing I want to show you guys, I think Al sent out an email about the, uh, the toolpath pattern stuff. Uh, so I made this little part. Some of you who have ever been in one of my classes before, like the seminars and stuff, and I see a couple of you. Hey, Matt, how's it going? A couple of you guys were in there not long ago. Uh, and I use a part very similar to this to talk about the three axis toolpaths. It's actually, uh, I just copied it four times. So what I want to do on this one is, in, and there's many ways to handle this. The way I would normally handle something like this would be I would program all four of them. They'd have separate boundaries. You know, easy does it, nothing, nothing too difficult. But I could also do a toolpath pattern on this. And this part lets me do a pretty decent toolpath pattern. So I'd like to show that to you guys. And so I'm going to start off, I'm just going to go make a set of toolpaths for this one uh, sphere shape. If you look, it's just a, just a sphere cut out in there. And then I repeated that four times. Um, so I'm just going to right click here. We'll do our mill three axis. Geometry, even though I'm only going to be machining that one pocket, this one here, I'm going to drag my box over the whole part and hit OK. All right, that's how we pick our geometry all the time. All right, now I also want to show you one other thing. I'm, I just canceled out of that. I keep forgetting about this thing. Uh, I have yet to really add this to my, my repertoire, but it is something I want to. Uh, it's, it's new to version 34. It's a killer function when you get to use it. Um, right there. So over here, I have it uh, a part of my measure entity box. So I have selections and measure entity here. Um, what this allows me to do is save selections of geometry to use at a later time. All right. So it's not something I'm going to use all the time. It's really on any geometry you think you might have to pick more than once, which a lot of times for me, that ends up being boundaries on 3D jobs. Um, really anything. And I, I might actually be able to pick this when I pick my boundary. Let me find out. So let's do select boundary. If I pick that, can I save that? I can. Oh, that's amazing. All right. So what I've done here, and let me delete this selection so I can show you. I've never done it that way. Normally, the way I would do this is I would extract an edge or however I, you know, however you normally do your boundaries, pick it off the model. But right here with save selections, I can save any geometry that I select. So I'll do it through the through the feature again, because that worked out nicely. Uh, but I'll do a mill three axis. I'll do it outside the feature. So I'm just going to say extract edges, and I'm going to pick that edge. So it lights up red. Now you got to use certain features to do this, because if I'm not in a feature, I can't pick the edge of the model. But I should be able to go to like extract edges here. I can pick that edge, and then right here in that selection section, I can say save current selection, and it'll save that selection. So if I cancel out and I go and click on this right here, it automatically highlights it. It lets me use it again later on. And so I can go in, let's pick one, two, three, and four. This would be my normal boundary for a part like this. And so you can see it says selection two, and there's one entity, and selection three, and there's four entities. So that's the difference between them. So now using that selection, all right, uh, or we could, let's do another one. We'll pick our model, right click, or not right click, we'll just say save right there. So now what I have is the model and the boundary on these saved selections layers. And again, with something so simple, I would never waste the time doing this realistically. But I could go in here and say mill three axis, select geometry, pick my model, go to my boundary, pick my boundary, and hit OK. Maybe you're doing a bunch of parts. Oh, that doesn't even come into play. I was going to say, maybe you're using the same part to go in and do multiple work offsets, but you don't have to do that anymore because we could just duplicate work offsets. So you don't even have to mess with that anymore. So uh, yeah, save, save geometry. I use it mostly for boundaries and it's only usually on boundaries that take me a while to pick. And I do it, you know, I usually extract the edges and then select it and then save that selection. And in case I need it again, I can always pick it again. 
if you guys get into some difficult three axis parts, you'll see that sometimes boundaries get, uh, they get a little crazy. They're a little tough to control once in a while. So right here, we're just gonna go down to the strategy. I'm gonna choose the advanced rough and the equidistant, uh, just to rough it out and give me a nice clean finish here. For posting, I'm always gonna turn on arc fit um, because the advanced rough will give me arcs. The equidistant will never give you arcs throughout your program. So just remember that that's a lot of times why your, excuse me, why your um, code ends up so long when you use that tool path. So we'll go next. Uh, right here's our advanced rough. I'm just gonna go ahead and change the tool to a half inch flat. And I'm gonna make it a bit longer. Uh, so we'll say 2.75. The depth of the pocket's two and a half inches. So I do want to have enough enough to get down there. For the patterns, let's go with an adaptive roughing. I'm going to keep everything set to a zig and I'm going to climb mill. Right here for our depth of cut and step over. Depth of cut, I'm fine taking out a quarter of an inch per pass. Uh, but because I'm using the adaptive roughing option, you might even go more than that, honestly. Uh, I want to set my step over. I'll just set it to... Uh, well, 10% is 50 thou. We'll go 50 thou. That's a 10% step over. Now, the thing is, I'm going to leave some pretty decent sized steps on this part. So I'm also going to go in and add some intermediate steps to come back and remachine any of the steps that are left on the walls of the part. So I'm going to set my number of intermediate steps. You can do one, you can do two, whatever you want to do, uh, just like that. Now, right here's our tolerance. Half a thou is always a fine place to be for the most part. Uh, when you get into some crazier stuff with the three axis, uh, like the equidistant stuff, you might drop that down to a tenth, and that's just going to give you a more accurate tool path. But be aware, it's going to take longer to calculate if you do it that way. The minimal curvature radius is the smallest radius that's allowed to be used to cut your part. The goal of the adaptive toolpath, one of the goals, is to never do a, a pure sharp corner, 90 degree kind of turn. It doesn't like to do sharp corner turns. So there's always going to be a radius in its movement. And that's why this is actually a great toolpath when you're doing slots. Instead of going 100% face cut through a slot, you could get it to do, it's not a spiral, uh, it's called a trichoidal pattern. But like picture if you cut this right here and this is a little slot, it's gonna eat its way into that, not all, not take a huge bite and kind of 100%. It's gonna work its way into that based on your step over. So it's gonna be a lot, uh, a lot more graceful. Uh, depth options, honestly, not something I change too often unless I need to stop the tool path at a certain uh, position, if I wanna stop at a certain depth then I will change the, the option to the user defined. But usually it's not something I do on this part, especially. Uh, right here for the leads, just gonna plunge in. I ah, will ramp in, we'll give it a ramp, we'll do a spiral. Uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna ramp in with a spiral. The ramp length is a quarter of an inch uh, and the angle of approach is just three degrees. For the options, this is an option I always turn on. It's machine flatlands. Um, the main reason I use machine flatlands isn't because it's there to machine the flat geometry. Uh, what it actually helps out with is if there's a floor or a ledge that happens to fall between your depth of cuts, this will go back and remachine those. So if I have my depth of cut set to a quarter inch and I have a ledge below the top of the part that's an eighth inch deep, Bobcat's going to ignore that. This toolpath will ignore that if you don't come in and turn on machine flatlands and basically tell it, yes, I know you're going a quarter inch for every depth of cut, but on the areas that need it, go ahead and kind of add some, add some extra passes in to flatten the floors and get me to the right size on most of my floors. Um, doesn't really do anything to this part. Um, so it's, it's up to you if you turn something like this on. Uh, this is also a very simple part. I don't go crazy when I show the examples for this one, but uh, yeah, this isn't a, that crazy of a part. You got your boundary options. So we did pick a boundary, but I want to stay inside the boundary. So I'm going to use the center of the tool. I'm not going to mess with the smoothing at all. And my intermediate steps are going to happen after all the initial roughing has happened. All right. Next, we have our links. Uh, no real changes there. I'm just going to use it the way it is. We have our, our clearance for the uh, adaptive tool path. Going to leave the defaults there. 
gouge checking. For gouge, che gouge checking for me is one of those things I don't use it super often um, because usually if I'm gouging the part, I'm going to be looking for a gouge, you know, in my simulation. And if I see a gouge, my first step isn't to go try and use gouge checking. Usually my first step is to go try and figure out why that's happening. It's usually something wrong with a boundary or a geometry selection. So that's always my first step. Uh, for me, I primarily use gouge checking. Uh, I primarily use it for fixtures. You know, I'll bring my vice into Bobcad. I'll have my part sitting on the vise, and if I got to get close to the jaws of the vise, then I make sure to go in and pick those as gouge check surfaces so I can keep myself away from that. Um, but again, I have no idea if there's a gouge. I haven't even watched the simulation yet, so I'm just going to hit next. For the advanced feeds, we got convert rapids to feeds. We got our link feed rate. Uh, that's a, I guess it's not a percentage of the feed rate. It's a feed rate to use while linking. And then you have your adaptive feed rate. So you have adaptive volume based, meaning we're going to change the speed of the cutter based on the amount of volume you're engaged with at any given time. Um, so uh, kind of an example of that is if you were cutting one of these little pockets and you're working your way down this, you know, down this far side, the right side of the tool is going to be in contact with that wall until we get to the corner where now the right side and the front side are encountering the wall. The adaptive volume based, I usually set it up where my max feed rate is 100. That's the feed rate I plan on using for everything. And then the minimum feed rate, it's a percentage of that feed rate. So I usually go like 50%, depends on what you're doing. But as it engages that front of the tool with the right of the tool, it'll slow down. And then as it makes its way through the cut, it'll speed back up. Now, you also have radial chip thinning where you're just setting it up to just ensure that Bobcat gets the, the largest chip it can every time it, uh, every time it makes a pass. So the minimum, again, I'd, you know, 50%, 20%, whatever you want to do. Uh, but usually when I do my max feed rate, it's my maximum feed rate. That's what I entered in when I was defining my tool. So, yeah, I'm going to go with standard, though. And then on to the equidistant. This is going to be a half-inch ball. And I'm just going to change the overall length here so I have enough stick out on that tool. Uh, for the patterns, I don't have any drive curves. I don't actually need to pick drive curves. The boundary that you select, if you do not pick drive curves for this equidistant, the boundary you select will be used as your drive curve. If you didn't pick a boundary, the shape of the stock will be used as your drive curve. So the, it really depends on the geometry. These are some simple ones, so I'm not too worried about it. Uh, I want to go from the top to the bottom. So it goes from the top down. Parameters, I'm just going to set this to a 20 thou finish. Should come out looking pretty decent. Right here we have our leads. No changes on that. The options, no changes on that. Uh, no angle ranges or really anything on here. All this is kind of just staying the same. Other than, and this is totally up to you, and I'll show you some more with this later on. This cutting extents here, uh, you have the extents part bottom. 3D extents and top and bottom of vertical walls. Uh, I don't usually change this for this part because I, I'm not going really outside the stock at all. But usually when I'm doing a three axis path, I'm going to turn on this 3D extents option. It allows the center of the tool to pass over the edge of the part enough that it's going to get a, get rid of any little ski jumps that are left on the part. Um, so there we go. I'll use that. And uh, next, right here, we have our link. So we can go follow, we can go direct, we can do an S-link or a full retract. Again, no gouge check at this point and no advanced feeds changes. Other than we do have some feed rate options for when you're doing up versus down cutting. Um, I'm, I'm doing from top to bottom in circular form. So it's, it's going to go from the top down. We aren't doing any up cutting on this one. And a lot of that really happens based off of my... Um, well, my boundary or my drive curve to tell it that it's a circular part. All right, we could also, let me go back to my patterns page. We could also do a spiral. Let's do it with a spiral. There we go. And then when we're all done, we can hit uh, compute. Now, I will show you guys a little trick. I think some of you may have seen this before. Uh, I always get nervous when I hit compute when I after I've gone and set up a bunch of three-axis toolpaths because I've gotten burned in the past. Um, and if you ever think to yourself, I should save my work, it's probably already too late. Um, so what I'm going to do is instead of hitting compute, I'm going to hit finish. All right. 
and then I'm going to go and save it. So I can hit save, and that way I don't have to ever recreate this toolpath if something happens. Now, I'll say it's it's very rare for me, at least. Some of you guys might have different uh, differences on this. I usually, I, I rarely crash Bobcad these days. Uh, it's fairly stable for me. I mean, when I'm doing some, some I, I've definitely gotten it to crash, even the new versions. But it's definitely a lot better than it was in the past. Um, it's a lot more difficult. So I trust it a lot more, but I don't trust myself that much. So I like to save often. So now I've saved it. The toolpath is is done, but I haven't computed it yet. So now I'm going to right click on the feature three axis and compute all that toolpath. And so this will take a second because it's the advanced rough with the equidistant. But uh, yeah, give it give it a second. Oh man, I got a lot of you guys in here. I know quite a few of you. This is great. Usually it's a bunch of names I don't know. I'll start I, I could name them, but I don't want to call you you guys all out. I know quite a few of you. Glad you guys are here. Done a bit of OLT with uh, a few of you. Yeah. All right. So now we have one of these pockets done. All right. And we could do all four. Again, the difference between one and four is literally this selection right here and doing them all. <coughs> they will take longer to calculate when you're doing more of them, though, because it basically has to apply it to all of them. The thing is, all four of these are the exact same part. All right. So instead of programming all four of them, another way I could do this, get out of here. Another way I could do this is by using toolpath patterns. All right. And there's a few different options for this, depending on how you need to do it. All right. So to get into toolpath pattern, it really depends on what you're patterning. So if you go and create a machine setup and you set up an entire job and then you want to pattern the entire job, you right click on machine setup one under additional functions here. You have add toolpath pattern and that's going to pattern every toolpath you've done. For me, it's the same whether I do it, do it this way or another method is maybe there's only one toolpath you need to pattern. Well, instead of doing the entire job from the machine setup level, you can do just the feature that you need to change or that you need to make the copies for. So I'm going to right click on this feature three axis and right down here we have toolpath pattern. Now, the first thing we need to know, depending on which one we're using, the first one we'll look at is this array feature. We need to know the distance, and I always base it off kind of the center of the geometry or the center of the toolpath. I need to know the distance from here to here, here to here. And just so happens I do because I made this. This is a six inch wide part that I then mirrored and made copies of. Um, so the distance from here to here is six inches, and the distance from here to here is six inches. So with the array feature, I can come in and say the distance in X, six inches. Well, how many copies do we want? Remember when you're doing copies, you don't count the one that you have. I need two in X, I have one, so I'm gonna do one copy. Now I can do my distance for Y, I'll say again, six inches. And again, this copy kind of happens first, the X is gonna get copied. And then I want to make one more copy in the Y. So the copies for Y are also going to be one. Or if I had a bigger piece and I was doing a bunch of these, I can copy them as many times as I want, even if the geometry is not there for it. So now I'll hit OK. And we'll see now I have that toolpath in all four of those positions. All right, so there's the array. The next one, let's go ahead and edit this pattern. And we'll go previous. The next one is translate. 
Now, translate works, uh, but you definitely, you'd either want points or you would want to know your distances. It just so happens, once again, we know these distances because it's a very simple part. So what translate's going to allow you to do is translate this a certain distance. Think of this as an incremental move. My toolpath is sitting here. I want to move it. In this case, what's going to happen, I want to move it over six inches in X and up six inches in Y. So if I hit OK, we lose the other two copies. This is one of the ones that I probably wouldn't use uh, really on the same part, especially one that's very symmetrical like this. Uh, maybe I have you know this one here and another part. The thing is, and a lot of guys think about it, you know, they think this way, where I want to just take that toolpath and copy it to my second vice. You know, I just want to copy that over to the second vice and run it again. Great thought. It, it would be awesome if you could set everything up perfectly, then it'll work. If you could set up your two parts in Bobcat and get your distances, and they were the exact same as the machine, then that'll work. But if you're gonna go and do two vices on a machine, I would rec recommend not using the toolpath pattern method, uh, but using the work offset patterns, which I'll show you guys that right here at the end of this. It's very easy. Um, so again, translate's not really the best one. Um, I could go edit this and change the Y to zero and hit okay and get the second one. And then I believe I can add a second one. So we'll do a translate. And we'll do our copies. This time we're going to go in Y6, copies one, hit OK. And that'll give me the copy. But I had to use two translates to get there. And it's honestly, it's a little bit, little bit tougher. So I'm going to delete that one. Yep. And I'm going to go edit this other one. So now the next option we have is rotate. Now rotate's got to be a very specific you know, part to work on with rotate, but in my case, I can rotate it. It's here, I wanna rotate it to these other three positions. So when you do your rotate, you first have to define the angle between your, your cuts. Um, you know, though it doesn't look like these are 90 degrees apart, they are 90 degrees apart. You can figure it out by saying they're evenly spaced, it makes a full circle, you go 360, divided by four, because that's how many we got, and you end up with 90 degrees per you know, rotation. The rotation uh, copies, the number of copies, again, is the total number you need minus the number you have programmed. So we had four, or we have four that we need. We've programmed one, so the copies are going to be three. Now, the rotation axis, you could go and pick. And for me, it's going to be that point right there. I didn't actually draw a point there, though. I'm just going to type in that I want my rotation axis to be around X0, Y0. Now I can hit OK. Now, just before I hit OK, I'll talk about this 3D option. This 3D option is usually used with four axis jobs where you're going around your, you know, if you got a four axis, you'd be going around your X axis. Um, but we're not going to go with that. We're just going to do a 2D rotation. And then I'll hit OK. And there we go. Once again, we have all four of them. Now, this one might run a little bit differently because the, the tools are spinning. You know, they are rotated around. Uh, but the finish should be the exact same. So that's your rotated one. Now, the last one, if I go in and edit this, is called points. And points allow you to go and pick the, the, the point at which you want to copy from and then where you want to copy to. So I'm going to go in and say, pick my points, and I'm going to turn on my points, and I'll say, I want to move from this point here. This is the one I've programmed, so I'll hit OK. And I want to go and pick my positions now. I want to copy here, I want to copy here, and I want to copy here. All right, and I'll hit OK. And then you'll see the machining order down at the bottom. You can do optimized, which is just going to kind of pick the best order for it. Or you can do pick order where it'll run in the exact order you just picked it. So it should do this one, then this one, then this one, then this one. And when we're all done, we can hit OK. And there we have it. So from there, I don't think I can change the machining order on this because it doesn't duplicate it. So I won't do that. Uh, from here, we'll go ahead and say start simulation. Now, with a toolpath pattern, uh, you got to think of it, it's running the entire toolpath four separate times. So it should have a few tool changes in it.
I'm, I'm expecting a few. The first one's going to do the advanced rough and the equidistant on here, and then it's going to do the advanced rough equidistant on here, advanced rough equidistant, advanced rough equidistant. That's how it should run. Let's go ahead and start the simulation to find out. And yeah, we'll just see. This is when you start getting nervous. We'll see if my simulation shows up. What's going on here? Oh, all right. This is why we, I didn't save either. I usually save before I launch the simulation every time. It's too busy talking. So if I lose it, not a big deal. I can recreate the toolpath pattern very quickly and recompute the toolpath. So it's not the end of the world. It might recover from this, but I'm usually too impatient to wait for it. So there's that. Um, come on now, you can do it or just give up. There you go. All right. So it took a second, uh, second to load. I'm going to go ahead and hit save right quick, just so I get a safe copy of it. You can save during simulation. It's not going to hurt anything. Uh, I don't usually recommend it. I usually try and say save outside of simulation, but not the end of the world. So again, it should be doing all the advanced roughs and then all the equidistance. That right there is one of the main reasons I try not to use this toolpath pattern feature for drilling holes. Uh, because if you do toolpath pattern a hole, then it's going to do the center drill and drill for one hole, and then it's going to go to the next hole. You lose all your can cycles. Basically, if you do a toolpath pattern of holes, instead of creating a can cycle that defines the hole that needs to be cut and then all the other positions, you get a can cycle def that defines the one hole that needs to be cut, cancels the, the can cycle, and then does another can cycle for the next hole. So it's not something I would prob. It's something I try to avoid using when I'm doing drilling. But there's a, a time and a place for everything, and I've had to do jobs that way, uh, just based off of you know a lot of times with this toolpath pattern, people are doing it because they don't have a second piece of geometry or whatever. There's again, you you could copy, you could do translates and make copies of geometry, but a toolpath pattern does make it easier. So we'll say run. And we'll speed this way up. So we'll do our advanced rough for the first one and then the equidistant. And I'm just going to go ahead and fast forward through this. So I'm going to pause this. So this is what it'll look like at the end of all the advanced roughs. Yeah, it's good to see so many of you here. It's been uh, a long time since I talked to some of you guys. All right, so this is what the advanced rough is going to be done, uh, what it's going to get done first. And then we're going to do the equidistant. It's a spiral toolpath. Uh, I'll just hit play. We'll see how it kind of moves around. Oh, that's too slow. So that's it moving around there, and it's just going to spiral its way down and eventually give us a pretty decent finish. It's an equidistant offset toolpath, so the space between the steps stays the same all the time. All right, so I'm just going to pause that one and run it. So again, not a bad way of doing it. It does group the tool together, so we're doing all of our advanced roughs, then switching the tool, then doing all the equidistance. But again, that does become problematic when you're doing... Mostly for me, it's drilling. Drilling's the one that really, really gets it because you keep resetting. You have to keep resetting your can cycle. And, you know, half the goal of drilling a bunch of holes with can cycles is it shortens your code. By doing a toolpath pattern on a drill, it actually makes your code longer. So just be aware of that. But there is my part right there. Look at beautiful. That's a 20 thou uh, step over for the equidistant. And uh, yeah, came out looking great. And it just copied that toolpath all the way around. Again, the right way to do that, or the way I would normally do that, would be I wouldn't use a toolpath pattern. So I delete this. Yep. And my boundary would end up being all four of those holes, or all four of those top arcs. And then I'll just compute the advanced rough because it's faster. 
the equidistant takes a bit longer to calculate. I'm not too worried about that. So we'll just calculate this. But this is, I mean, essentially going to give us the exact same result. It's the same result as programming all four of them, but potentially with a bit less time because you're not going to spend as much time calculating. And, uh, well, you, you don't, you, you know, I don't know. You don't have to spend as much time calculating. You do have to spend a little bit of time figuring out your toolpath pattern. And if you had some weird stuff, I don't know. There's there's a bunch of ways to do it. So we'll let this thing calculate, and then I'll show you guys the um, the other way of kind of doing this, or the way we could do it. Say this was one part, but we had it in two separate vices. We want to do two at a time. Uh, we could look at that real quick. So I'm just waiting for this to calculate. I probably shouldn't have done it, but. You live and you learn, right? Oh, a fan just turned on my PC. This desktop doesn't usually turn its fan on. That might be part of the problem with it, honestly. We'll see. So you can see it's definitely taking longer to calculate. Um, but now there is that toolpath for all four of them. We can hide that equidistant. So again, there's there's multiple ways to do that one. Um, you know, it's, it's however you want to work it out. I actually met a guy a couple of weeks ago that programs one of these pockets, and then he he uses G55, 56, and 57 separate work offsets for the other four. A lot more work, especially since it's all on one part, and he's got to find four locations. But however you want to do it, that that's whatever you want to do. So for the tool path, uh, or the, sorry, the work offset pattern now, so we're not using a tool path pattern. Basically, I'm going to set this one in one vice as G54, and I want a copy of it in another vice for G55 or 56, whatever many copies I want. The way we do it is you right click on the machine setup here and you just go to work offset pattern. Now there's a lot of stuff in here. There's a lot of stuff in here that you don't actually need. Um, most of this is for kind of copying your stock, your part, all that stuff. But honestly, I really don't care about that. I want to take this feature, which is G54, and I want to take the same thing and make it G55. So instead of worrying about the pattern type and the, you know, the distance between everything, um, really all I have to do is say, I want to do a work offset pattern. I want my increment to go up by one. So the work offset's going to be number two. So this is going to go from 54, two is G55. And I'm going to increment by one. Now, as far as the array parameters go, I can go in and, yeah, you could set your distance and say six inches or two feet or whatever your distance is. Um, if you are simulating the part like Matt said, then, yeah, you do, you do care about it. But the thing is, I'm copying the exact same part. If the simulation looked good on that one part, it's going to look fine on the other one. So definitely you want to do your copies. I have everything getting blanked out right now by default. Uh, but again, it's up to you. Uh, recording video, simulation videos is super helpful to communicate to setup guys. Absolutely. The thing is with this one, you're not, I mean, you're getting your copy for sure. Uh, it all depends on how much you've had set up. Uh, I was just doing a bunch of work offset stuff with a guy what, last week, two weeks, last week. And uh, yeah, we just did it this way because he knows that he's just cutting the same part. You know, if I'm cutting the one part, it's going to be the same on the other. Whatever my origin is on this part, which for me is just top dead center on that piece of stock, it's going to be the same for the other one. So yes, definitely if you're doing something for recording, you do want to turn this, you know, you could turn this off and pattern everything. You could even move your stock over, or move your part over uh, because I don't, or, or your work piece, I didn't really pattern any of it. Um, 
But right here, you then go in and pretty much right here are defining how many copies you want. So I want G54, G55. So I want one copy. If I wanted G54, G55, and G56, I would do two copies. You, you put that in, and then down at the bottom, you say generate copies. So this is number one. This is number two. I hit OK. And the way you'll know that a work offset pattern has been applied to the job is this little icon changes. Uh, let me show you this one. The normal icon is just your X, Y, Z little drawing there. After it's been patterned, you get two of them. All right, so I'll turn on the, I mean, I guess I could do the equidistant, or I'll do the equidistant, so I'll turn that off, hide that. So that's the one that's running. It's going to be a lot of code regardless, but I'll post my code, and there's no pattern happening. This is just one pocket right now, and then I'm just going to right-click in here and say NC Editor and launch it to the NC Editor, so I could just go search really quickly uh, for the G55. So, and see, there it is. Here it comes. All right, good. All right, and see, editor, where are you going? And there it is. So I'll say, let's click in here. We'll say find, there's G54. Let's go ahead and find G55 and just say find next. And it's literally just a copy of the machine setup for G55. All this code is going to be just set up for G55. So regardless of whether I see it in the simulation or not, if I simulated the one part and I make a toolpath pattern or a, sorry, a work offset pattern for it, it's going to give me the same result. Now, again, yes, if you're setting this up so you could show it to your, you know, show it to the setup guys or anything like that. Really, I mean, it's, it's the two vices. It's kind of, you, you get the two vices on the machine, put your two parts in and you're going to origin off the same spot on both, both parts. You know, even if they're at different heights, maybe you got a low profile vice and a set, you know, a regular, you know, Kurt vice, your G54, G55 will handle the difference in height and everything. So it's a really fast way of doing more than one. Now it does get a little bit weird if you're trying to get into like tombstone machining and some of the other stuff, but overall, not a bad option at all. So there it is. That is uh, your work offset patterns, your tool path patterns selections, a bunch of stuff. All right, so there we go. All right, something I ran into yesterday. Uh, if you guys ever call in, you could talk to, he's actually my little brother, his name's Max. Uh, he's working in tech support now. He was our onboarding guy. You guys might know Max if you ever call in. Nice guy. Uh, he had a customer that had an issue with a tool cutting down a, a not vertical wall, it had a taper to it, and it wasn't going past the bottom of the part. So what was happening is the tip of the tool with this ball mill was hitting the bottom of the part, which leaves a radius, a little ski jump on the bottom of the part. And I know a lot of you guys have heard me call them ski jumps many times before. Let's talk about fixing it because uh, both that customer and my little brother were very confused by it. So I'm just going to make a real quick, dirty, simple part. Uh, we'll go with a rectangle that's, uh, we'll say it's three by two is fine. That's fine. And then I'll go with this one at four by, uh, uh, let's go four by three. Yeah, just like that. The difference is I'm going to drop this thing down in Z two inches. So minus two. All right. And you can't see the difference yet, but I'll hit OK, cancel out, and then rotate. So I'm left with that kind of shape there. Now, before I go worrying about putting surfaces on here, because we're doing 3D today, we need to have surfaces, I'm going to add a new layer and call it solid. There we go. And uh, I'm going to go and put the walls on this whole thing. So a lot of you guys, when you do this, you might go the route of, okay, now I'm going to go in, I'm going to pick this corner here, and I'm going to go down to this corner here. And then over to here and down to this corner here. And then you're going to planar that. And you're, you're with this whole part, you'd end up doing planers around the whole thing. Very simple surfacing. Uh, a feature I seldom use is under Create 3D. It's this one right here. It's called a ruled surface. It creates a surface based on the two chains that you select. 
So when I go to ruled surface, what I want to pay attention to, the biggest, most important thing is where your start point comes out. So this one's real simple for me because they're two rectangles. All I have to do is pick this top line here and this bottom line here in the same kind of spot, and it'll be fine. Uh, but I'll show you what happens if you get it wrong. So I'm going to hold shift and pick the top shape. And I'm going to hold shift and pick the bottom shape. But instead of picking this left side like I did for this one, I'm going to pick the right side. And you get this weird zigzag crisscross surface. And uh, the reason that happened is, again, those two start points are in the wrong. They're not lined up with each other. So, again, the right way to do it is always to try and pick them with kind of a common selection. So I want to pick the bottom half of this line and the bottom half of this line while holding shift. So I'm going to hold shift, pick that line. I'm going to hold shift, pick that line. And now I have this beautiful looking tapered part here. So I'll hit OK. Cancel out. And then uh, I'll show you a little trick I use. I, I want to go in and planer that, but I'm also very lazy. So the way I do this is I'm going to move my check mark up to the CAD layer. I'm going to hide my solid layer, and I'm going to put my check mark back on the solid layer. So now any surfaces I create, I'm going to see the preview, but as soon as I hit OK, it's going to disappear. So you got to make sure the preview looks good. Uh, it should. They're very simple. The reason I did this is because when I go to do a planer on these two, with just wireframe, I can hold Shift. I can click on it as a chain select. And hit OK. Like I said, that looks good for the preview. When I hit OK, it'll disappear. So there's one, there's the other. And if I turn on my solid layer, I now have almost a full solid. We're almost done. What I have to do now is stitch the whole thing together because this is a bunch of separate surfaces. So I'm going to go stitch. Make sure the check mark is on whatever layer you want your solid to go to. Pick the whole part and hit OK. And then when we cancel out, now what we'll see is we have a single part. So pretty straightforward. All right, so I'm going to fly through this section here, just making some stock. I'm going to go a little bit bigger with the stock. So we'll go four and a half by three and a half. Two inches thick is fine. Origin, I'll leave it right there, top dead center. And I'll go uh, four inches here. So we'll hit OK. All right, now we can go start our three axis toolpaths. So I'm just going to right click here. And I'm going to do this as two separate toolpaths. One set for those of you guys that have the three axis standard. And just a couple with the, uh, the three axis pro. So for the geometry, just going to go pick the entire model. Hit OK. I'm not going to pick a boundary right now. So I'll just go next. For the strategy right here, we're going to get to the, let's do a Z-level rough and a Z-level finish. All right, and we'll start with that one. Always turn on the arc fit button. The only toolpath that doesn't affect is the equidistant. Every other one, if there's arcs in it, that's how you get them to output. All right, for the roughing tool, go with a half inch flat. And I'm just going to change the size of it a bit. We'll go 2.75. There we go. That should be plenty. Uh, for the patterns, pocket in, pocket out, kind of depends on what you're doing. Uh, I'm going to go with pocket in. The parameters, I'm going to use a depth of cut quarter inch, uh, step over 200 thousandths. I'm going to leave 15 thousandths on the finish. For the leads, no real changes there. Options, no changes there. Advanced feed rates, no changes. And then onto the Z-level finish. So Z-level finish, yeah, I'll use that half inch tool. I do want to make it a bit longer. There we go. It's a half inch ball mill on this one. For the patterns, just gonna go with a climb mill. For my depth of cut, I'll go 50 thou. All right. And then leads, uh, I'm not gonna do any pecking on that. Uh, we just wanna go options, no changes, links, no real changes, and then advanced feeds. So again, I'll say finish. Uh, let me do a save as on this. This is gonna be the uh, what do you call this? Uh, ski jump correction. Whoops. All right. So we'll hit save. Can Z level finish output cutter comp? Unfortunately, not. Most machines can't output uh, a cutter comp on any three axis moves. 
there is some we do not support those machines um so no yeah you're not going to get any compensation the only tool pass you'll get compensation on uh in bobcat or any of the profile the two axis profile style tool paths so you get it on profile rough and finish you'll get, get it on chamfer mills corner rounds uh and then thread mills so how do you finish the floor of a pocket uh you you, you could go in and remachine it with a two axis would be kind of your best option there. Um, yeah. So let's just say, yeah, there's, there, you'd have to add like a two axis toolpath. There's no 3d comp for it. So it'd be, that's really where your tolerances are going to come in. Your tolerances are what are going to get you the right finish on your floor for your three axis toolpaths. And then you got to make sure your, your, your tools are set correctly. You know, the biggest problem you'll run into is if a tool wears down, you know, since there's no cutter comp, I can't change it. So it's you'd have to either come back to Bobcat and re-enter the tool at its new diameter, or that's really it. Yeah, we don't really have anything to uh, to move it. Uh, why not use a sub-program routine for the 3D path, tool path pattern, shorter program? You could absolutely do sub-programs. Bobcat doesn't output sub-programs in the same way that you or I would create sub-programs. If it was me doing my own part, yeah, I would use a sub program. I'd have all my code in it, and then I'd have my my subs call out the new positions. The problem that Bobcat runs into, like on this example, is it doesn't recognize that these are all the same pocket. So you you could turn on sub programs, but you'd end up with four programs, four sub programs, uh, basically with you know kind of the first call out would be go here and run sub program one go here and run, run sub-program two, not go here and rerun sub-program one. So it doesn't, we don't have true sub-programs in that sense. Uh, usually I would, you know, copy and paste toolpath or copy and paste code into a sub-program. But, you know, realistically, the, the way that I would really go about machining this, something like this would just be to pick all the geometry and not run that sub at all, so. Hopefully that answered it. It's something I'm I'm hoping Dev's working on. Um, I know that I know that we've been working on it for years. I just who who knows when they're gonna finish it. It's been one of those things that's been requested many times. Um, I don't know exactly what the hangup is. If there's no way for them to tell that two pieces of geometry are the same, or what. Uh, all right. So and then would you say Ray when milling flatlands is there a way or is there a setting to slow down the final pass to achieve achieve a great mac micro finish? 100 inches a minute, maybe down to 10. Not really. The only tool pass that give you kind of the only one that would do something like that would be like a finish, like a two axis finish pass. Um, otherwise, it'd be yeah, somehow find you know going and finding that line in the code and changing the feed rate there. Um, but yeah, there's no way to to break down that final pass, like separate that final pass. The only tool pass that have, uh, yeah, no, there's no way to really slow that down for your final, you know, kind of finish pass of a flatlands or really any of these tool pass. I, I got, I don't have control over just a singular part of the pass. I have control over the whole pass, but I could definitely put that in for a uh, requested development. Uh, take the final pass, you know, your final contour cut has a specific feed rate that's definitely doable they might be able to do it on the um advanced feed rates page or i don't know maybe the parameters it, i could put something in for that right all right all right so we have our toolpath uh i think i left off i saved it so let me just save it again and then i'm just going to compute this guy now what you'll see is if i go to a front view this toolpath runs right to the bottom of the part which looking at it, you're like, oh, that's going to be great. That's where the tip of the tool needs to go. But let's go ahead and simulate that guy real quick. And we'll see what kind of... Now, I, I will start by saying the rough pass on this, I went a little aggressive with the quarter inch, 200 thou depth of cut kind of thing. So it is a pretty ugly rough pass when it's done. But uh, we should be able to see it. So let me speed this up a little bit. All right, like that. By the way, if you guys are using, or if you guys are doing three axis work and you're using just the three axis standard, 
I strongly recommend looking at the three axis pros. Uh, they are so much smarter in, in every sense of everything they do. Um, with the, the standard tool pass, a lot of times you do end up having to pick boundaries. But with pros, I have many parts that I don't end up picking boundaries for because it doesn't really need it. You know, when you're using the pros, if you want to cut the whole part, you can cut the whole part. If you're using the standards and you want to cut the whole part, you usually can. It depends. It's, you know, it's if you're doing a lot of 3D work, I could not I could not recommend enough that you look at the the three axis pros. So you'll see there's the bottom of the job or the, the final finish of the cut. And the reason that happened is because everything's based off of the tip of the tool. So since the tip of the tool is is at the bottom of the part, you still have that quarter inch radius on the part. So the tip of the tool was riding along right here and it left that big radius. So what needs to happen is I need that tool to go down further. All right. The way we do that with these standard tool paths, you just right click on your, uh, your Z level finish here. Or if you're in 34, you can double click on it. We're going to go to our parameters page and we're going to set a bottom of job. Now with the standard tool paths, a lot of the ways to get around the limitations of of the toolpath is to give it permission to break the rules of the toolpath, if that kind of makes sense. Uh, basically, if I go with a bottom of job and I say, I wanna pick the bottom of the job right here and I pick that point and I hit okay. And I add, I, I'll say, let's go down an extra quarter of an inch. So we're going from the top of the part, which is zero. I'm telling it to go down two and a quarter inches, which is a quarter inch lower than our part. But by doing it this way, I give it permission to go below the bottom of the part. So I'm gonna hit finish, save, and then compute the tool path. And that simply, we are now going further on the part. That one's one of the easier ones because it's only one setting to fix it. So if we were to do the same thing, but with the pro tool path, so let me just go in, we'll do our mill three axis, select geometry, there's our geometry, we'll hit okay. Uh, we'll set this one up with an advanced rough and an advanced Z level finish, all right? So right here, you got your, uh, well, let's pick our half inch flat there, use the same tools. Uh, I'm not gonna go too crazy on this one, just gonna do my depth of cut quarter. 200 and this time I could do intermediate steps. So I could say give me one more cut on there uh, Leads no changes there options. No real changes there Links, this is just a rough pass. So I'm gonna leave it pretty basic now for the finish pass. There's our half inch ball once again The patterns we want to start from the top work our way down. I want to zig so I keep everything moving in one direction and Then we're gonna climb mill. depth of cut. I'll go 50 thou now, normally when I do a tool path like this, when I get to this options page and, and you'll, you'll hear it in the videos and if I've ever done training with you in the past, you'll hear me say it. The one I usually use is 3D Extents. All right, so I'm just gonna hit finish. I'm gonna hit save and then I'll go ahead and compute that one. So we'll compute that, shouldn't take too long. And go ahead and we'll blank that out. So here's our advanced rough. It goes to the bottom of the part, which is fine. That's a flat tool. And then there's that one. Once again, it, it ends right at the bottom of the cut. So if we, so I have the three axes turned off the standards. Let's go ahead and start the simulation and see what we get. And then right here, this is just the advanced rough. So I like this one. It doesn't reverse direction. For some reason, the Z-level rough sometimes flips directions while it's machining the rough. This one keeps everything moving in one direction. Gets rid of uh, actually all the geometry. We might not have anything left after this anyway, just because of that roughing coming in. Um, what did I do last time that made it stay there? I don't know. We'll find out. So it's going to take this off. We might have a little lip left on this one, but it shouldn't be nearly as bad as the... Uh, I know what it is, it's those intermediate steps. So you can see it still leaves the lip on the bottom of that, doesn't cut it past. So we'll go make the same change we did before. We'll go into the advanced Z level, 
And again, you go to your parameters and you set your bottom of job. So this one's going to be minus 2.25. And I'll just say finish and then compute on that one. And what we're looking for is more toolpath all the way around that goes down. Not just one pass. I want the whole thing going down. So that might be good. But notice it trimmed the toolpath here. It's not like the Z-level finish that goes all the way around. And the difference is we've told it to go to the bottom of the, you know, the depth of the cut, but we didn't fully give it permission to go down all the way at the end. All right. So right here, we're going to say edit. On your options page, instead of using 3D extents, the part that gives you the permission for this is the part bottom option. This is saying go to the bottom of the job. Well, the bottom of the job was defined as minus 2.25. So I'll hit compute. And now you'll see it's going to go all the way around to that level. Again, a lot of this just turns into, are you giving it the permission to do what it needs to, you know, to go down that far? Um, and that'll, that'll kind of do it. So now we can go simulate this one more time. And I won't, we won't sit through the whole thing here. We'll just fast forward through it. And then, yeah, we'll just zip right through here. And this should come out. Granted, I mean, it's a, what, 50 thou, I think I did for the finish. It's not the greatest finish in the world. But now you'll see we will end up with a nice corner on the bottom of the part. And to fix the walls, I just go with a smaller depth of cut. So, again, if it's it, for me, it's easier to handle that with the Z-level finish, the standard one, the, because I always forget to turn on part bottom on the advanced one. But... Again, part bottom is going to use the bottom of the part based on what you tell us the bottom of job is on the parameters page. So if you ever change that and you can't get it to go deep enough, go turn on that uh, the bottom of job or what is it? Part bottom? I don't know. Part bottom, right? Yeah, part bottom. Turn that option on and you're telling it it's allowed to go beyond the bottom of the part or the bottom of the stock. It's Again, you're giving it that permission to do it. All right. So we'll just say finish and close. All right, Cliff, if there's time at the end, could you show me how to mill a basic pocket and finish the floor and walls to size? Yeah, we can do that. So basic pocket, milling walls and floors to size. So I'm just going to open up a new new one. This is all 2D, um, but uh, one of the guys is asking for it. Wait, what? What planet Bob can for a machine? Sorry, what plan at BCC for HEM? Is that high speed machining? Yes, okay. Uh, the one you'd want would be, I mean, I don't know about five axis. I don't know off the top of my head which tool pass would have, if there's any that have the adaptive feeds. In Bobcad, anything that's high speed machining is going to be labeled with adaptive roughing right there. And then on the advanced feed rates page, that's where you would define the radial chip thinning. And we're using the settings based on whatever tool you set in. So your feed per tooth is the chip size um, that we're going to use. Um, but yeah, it's any of the, you, you have it on two axis pockets and you have it on the three axis advanced rough and uh, flatlands. Flatlands will also have it. As far as I know, I'd have to look into the five axis stuff. Uh, for radial chip thing, I think it's in. Some, I think it might be in there somewhere. Um, honestly, off the top of my head, I have no idea. I could look at it for you though. Um, so, are you say what plan has? Five uh, predicts calculates constant strength, which is Q effective. Are you saying what are we going to do for that in the future, or do we have that now? I don't know. Um, yeah, future. I, I honestly have no idea what their plans are for multi-axis simultaneous stuff in the future, if there's going to be ever a, a chip thinning option or not. Um, yeah, not right now, as of now. So uh, what was your question there, Ray? Has the post department had a chance to implement selecting multiple posts with one post and save? 
So you're ty- saying posting to multiple machines uh, in one, you know, just post and it'll post to three different post processors or something, Ray? That is, if that's what you're saying, that is not uh, anything we have as of now. Um, I don't, I feel like one of the posting guys did put that in recently. I think I saw that bug report in the, uh, in our database, but I'm not hundred percent sure. All right. So Ray, I'm going to, or Ray, not Ray, Cliff, I'm going to draw out a real uh, quick one. It's a four by four square with a two by two square inside of it with some radius corners, quarter inch. That's fine. So we'll use our half inch tool to cut it. So I'm just going to go make some stock real quick. Very simple part here. Yeah, Ray, you, you'll have to post with one and then switch the post processor in the machine or just switch the machine, which will automatically grab the post. It depends on how you have it set up. If you have two separate machines in Bobcad, you switch the machine. Each machine has its own post to it. If you're doing the same machine, but the posts are different, you just switch the post and then, yeah, post it twice and save them so you know which one's which. Uh, all right. So right here, our origins, fine. Top dead center, I'll go there. All right, so uh, Cliff, when you're doing a pocket, so I'm gonna go mill two axis, select geometry, pocket. I'll go a half inch deep, that's fine, simple stuff. If you wanna finish the floor, to, <laughs> I get it, Ray, I'm also the same. Ray said he's lazy, that's why he wants to do, uh, post more than one at the same time. I'm the same and I always look for that stuff. And I, I actually think I saw the post guys work, put something in for that so you could post to multiple machines, but. So with this one, Cliff, we're going to go with a pocket and a profile finish. Now, if you're trying to do the pocket and leave material on the floor and then come back maybe with a, a better finisher or a, uh, a different tool with different feeds and speeds, you'll have to add a second pocket in. And you do that just by clicking on available operations and moving it over. Normally, the way we do, the, the way I do pocketing and the, the way I think probably most of us do pocketing here. You'd set it up with a pocket and a profile finish. The pocket is gonna go in and finish all the way down to the floor. It's going to finish the floor of the pocket because that, that's, that's all set up with your height offsets in your machine and your tool. As long as that's all right, you're gonna get the right level of floor. The walls though, will usually be handled by your profile finishes, all right? So that's gonna be done, let's go here. Uh, I'll just get down to here. So we got our half inch flat rougher. I'm going to use the same tool between the two. Okay. Um, again, if you were going to try and machine the floor as a separate set of feeds and speeds, you would have a second pocket in here, but normally you pick your pocket, you pick the tool for it for the parent or for the patterns here, you do whatever advanced pocket. I'll do an offset pocket out 40% step over. All right. This is where you're defining if you were going to come in, if you were going to come in and do an allowance on the floor, again, if you set a number in that bottom allowance there, you need a second pocket to come in and clean it up afterwards. If you don't, this tool, this half inch tool that I picked is going to finish the floor of the pocket to, in our case, a half inch deep. All right. But on the walls, I'm leaving 15 thousandths. That's what the finish tool is going to come clean up. And that's where I'm going to apply that G41, G42 cutter compensation. And we'll get there in one second. So I'll do this in two passes. Right here, we'll go next. No changes. Sequencing, don't really care. Links, not too worried. Get down to the finish pass. So it's the same tool, but it's coming up as tool number two. And that's because this tool is getting pulled from the finish category. And this one's getting pulled from the rough. So if I do want to use the same tool or I want to use a separate tool, totally up to you. I'm going to use the same tool. All right, there, use the same tool number one there. And on this patterns page here, this is where you would set up that compensation. Now, again, this compensation is only for the walls. So you have two forms of compensation. There's system comp, which means we are compensating the tool for you. We have a half inch tool that we chose. We're gonna shift that tool over a quarter of an inch to make sure we cut the walls to the correct size. If your tool's worn out though, that doesn't work as well because now you got a tool that's a little undersized. And so when you do your compensation, it doesn't, doesn't line up again. 
It's, you know, you're, you're going to leave a little bit of meat on the wall still because your tool's undersized. And we're only comping whatever the diameter of the tool or whatever the radius of the tool is. So the way I use it is for the machine comp, I would set it up for a G41. And I actually run both of them. I don't know about any of you guys how you do it, but I do the uh, both of them. So the system compensation is already compensating my tool for me. The G41 is going to be in my code so that at the machine, I could make a fine adjustment based on the wear. You know, so I'd enter my I'd enter my wear offset as, you know, whatever I need to do to make up for the rest of the tool. And then that would give me the ability to cut the pocket again, you know, resize it and get it to the correct size. So that's the one that's going to let you fix the walls. Again, if you're doing floors, you need to do that as a separate pocket. There's no compensation for the floor. That's all based off of, you know, your tool, your, when you touch your tools off and when you set your height offsets in the machine. The rule though is if you decide to use a G41, you will no longer be able to, or you can't use a vertical lead in. You have to use anything but vertical. The G41 will not even show up in the code if you leave this thing on vertical. So I'm gonna go with a circular lead. My rule of thumb is just use half the tool. If it fits, great. If it doesn't, we could always change it. Uh, because again, right now, if you think about your leads the way we're looking at them right now, anything, uh, anything larger than whatever allowance I left is a fine lead in. Anything over 15 thousandths will be fine. And it'll be enough that we could apply that, that compensation. But again, the rule of thumb I use is just half the tool. It's easy to remember if it doesn't fit. I can adjust these down to around 15 thousandths is the smallest, all right? So the quarter types, sequencing, no changes there. We'll just hit compute. And uh, let's go ahead and blank this out real quick. I can just do this right here. And uh, here is our pocket. And then here's our profile finish. So if I post the code to this, again, the pocket's just, just going to cut with the pocket cuts. But the finish pass is going to have this G41 in it that we could then compensate to clean up the walls, to get the walls to the right size. Um, but again, the pocket, the, the only tool pass that have that G41 are any of these profile style tool pass. They're not going to clear out the inside. They're just going to finish the walls. So you got your profile rough, profile finish, chamfer, corner round, and thread milling. So, yeah. Also, if you guys need more information, uh, I'll pull this up real quick. I've been updating this a lot better lately. Uh, let me just open a whole new window here. If you go to our website, it's bobcadsupport.com here. All right. So this will help any of you guys that are looking for... Uh, yeah, Matt. So if you're looking at your, if you're not getting comp on your, on your tool path, check your leads. That is usually the biggest cause where G41 is not coming out. You can't use a vertical lead in. All right. So here's my, uh, my Bobcad support site. These are free for all of you guys. I'm not even signed in right now. You just go up to training. You go down to recorded virtual events and uh, Cliff. Matt, if you're interested, I would strongly recommend go through this list here on the left. You got V, uh, that's, here's our two axis mill right there. So that was what I did uh, back in December. You go in there, probably two hours long, I think, hour and a half, two hours. Um, you go in, you, you watch those, and they will cover a little bit more about what exactly you're looking at. Uh, same with you, John, talking about the rest procedure, but I'll show you the rest roughing real quick. Uh, I think I have an example of it. So there's a bunch of them. We have two axis mill, and then any of the ones from last year are actually four hours long or close to four hours long because we were doing before lunch and after lunch. So that one's going to be even longer, probably go into a bit more detail there. Um, but yeah, hopefully that answered your question. And again, you guys are, this is this is for you guys to watch anytime you want. We got Bob Art, we got laser plasma, water jet, wire EDM, lathe. And then you can see if you got some uh, add-ons like you know, the Bob Cam for SolidWorks or Rhino, we have some videos for that as well. So check that page out. There's a, a lot of content on here. Most of these are about four hours, three to four hours long. So there's a lot going on in there. And you, it's, it's done by me. It's done by our old trainer, Darren, and it's done by Andrew. So you get kind of three perspectives on how you can, uh, how you can do that part.
So let me get rid of some of these questions. That, that, that. All right, run through an example of the REST procedure. Um, yeah, I can. Let me do, let me just do this. So I'm going to copy this pocket here and I'm just going to paste it right below it. All right, so whenever you're doing a, a REST procedure, whether it's two axis or three axis, because you do have REST roughing and REST finishing inside the Pro Tool paths, most of them. Uh, like the advanced rough has rest roughing and then all the finish passes will have rest finishing. You're always going to do two of them. So the first one is going to be used to just kind of, that's your main one. That's going to be the biggest tool you want to run on this part. So for me, I'm going to edit this and I'm going to change this guy to a, a one inch tool. Crazy big for that pocket, but I'll run it. All right. Now, as I go through here, it's just going to be a stand, you know, a normal pocket. Nothing special about the first one. All right. We get down to... The second pocket here, I'm going to use this half inch tool. When I get to the patterns page right here, and I'm using an advanced pocket, you can't use the standard pocket, you got to use advanced. Down at the bottom, we have rest roughing. Or if you're doing this in the three axis, it's on the options page for all of them. So you go in. The big thing I, I always try to make sure I do when I do the rest roughing is I make sure that on my second pocket here, I have my first one in the same wizard. So I don't want to make a tool path and then come in and, and add another one that applies rest roughing. And the main reason I don't do that, it's totally doable, but the main reason I don't do that is because when I choose rest roughing, it automatically grabs the information from the previous tool, from the previous feature that's in here. And again, if this feature wasn't in here, I'd have to type this in. It's not the end of the world, but it's one less thing I got to worry about if I do it. So that's how I do it. All right. And then you go through it normal, you know, same, same pocketing routine pretty much. And I uh, will go ahead and hit compute. So if I blank this tool path out, we can see here is our one inch pocket. So it's going to go in, we'll back plot that guy. It's going to go in, rough out what it can. But biggest thing here is it cannot fit inside the, the corners of this part. You can see it right there. There's a big gap right there. So that's what it's going to look like. And then we can go and see the second one. This is just going to go clean up the areas where that previous tool didn't fit. So if I simulate this one, we'll actually see it a little bit better. And so this one's going to be, this is the one inch tool going in here and uh, I'm just going to let it Pocket its way out. What are you shouting about? Oh, it's my other computer. All right, so we go in, we, we make our one inch cut. Or our one inch tool cut right there. And then we switch and now we're just cleaning up the corners with that half inch tool, kind of bringing it into size. And you could work your way down. I've had guys that run parts where they start off with a a lot of them was with uh, three axis when they're when you're using the advanced rough. But I've had guys that get some real, you know, parts that they got to take a lot of material off. And then they also have some fine finishing that's kind of happening there. And what ends up happening is, well, basically you go in, you uh, you set up multiple uh, rest roughs or in, in my case, it's the advanced roughs. You use like four advanced roughs. Your first one starts out with a one inch tool. Second one goes down to a, a three quarter inch tool. Third one goes down to a half. And then the final one might be a quarter inch tool. It takes a lot longer to calculate when you do that. But by setting up a job that way, you end up removing, you end up letting the tools kind of remove the most that they can. And most of your tool pass will just go in and kind of work on cleaning up corners, tightening up corners. Or I used to have a part back in the old training videos. Let me see if I can find it. Um, this. Come on. So I go training files. I think I have it in here. 32 mil uh, part files right here. So I believe I have it in here. Let me find it. 3D machining example number three. I think that's the one. 
let me pull this up and I'll tell you for sure. There it is. Yeah, so this is the one that I've done it with. Uh, or you can actually see it inside of, uh, it's actually shown inside of, for three axis, it's actually shown, if you go to help and then getting started, this three axis profile here has, uh, that three axis profile has an, it has the uh, advanced rough with the rest rough. This one does as well. You can see there's two advanced roughs on here. Um, apparently these tool paths are not calculated. Uh, this one is going in with a one inch insert cutter. This one's going in with a three eighths. So let me go ahead and compute this thing. Geometry is still good. All right, let me go ahead and compute these one at a time so we don't have to sit through all of them because I don't care about the finish passes. No problem, Cliff. Like I said, there is in that on that website, uh, the bobcadsupport.com, there is a bunch of those. At some point, I know for sure I went through rest roughing, rest finishing, uh, and just pocketing in general, um, especially in the 2D CAD days. So check those ones out because they'll, I think, definitely answer some of your questions uh, for it. So this first tool path, again, this is going to be a one inch, and then we go down to a three eighths, and I'll just wait for it to compute so I can show it to you. So there's our first one. Let's go ahead and compute this one. And while that's computing, I can move that. So notice this, it goes in and machines a lot of stuff away. This back little slot right here, it doesn't touch because the tool cannot fit in there. So when we do this rest rough and we switch it to this 3 ace, uh, 3 ace tool here, you'll see the result here in a second. Well, whenever it decides to finish. The rest roughing always does take a little bit longer to calculate, but overall not too bad. I mean, it's this is normally the time when if I wasn't on a on a you know video with you guys, I'd get up and go use the washroom, go get a drink, cup of coffee, you know, hit compute, go walk away for a few minutes, come back. Um but honestly, none of these are, none of it's that bad. In the, I, I remember when I first started using Bobcat, I started on, it was version 23 and then right, right around when version 24 came out. And that was back when everything was still 32 bit and didn't, ma didn't matter how good of a computer you really had. Um, you were only using one core of your processor when you were doing your, uh, your calculations. So now everything's 64 bit, it runs multi cores. And it calculates a lot better. So overall, I mean, it's something like this used to take. I've seen I've seen tool paths that took hours to calculate that. By the end, you know, by now they would be just a few minutes. You know, it really comes down to the int you know how big is the part, how tight is your your tool path, how tight is your tolerance. That's a huge one. A um, lot of guys with rough passes. Uh, end up wasting a bit of time. I do. I do the same. It's not. I'm not saying there's a bad or you know anything wrong with it. But when you're doing like an advanced rough, your tolerance. If you're leaving, you know, fifteen thou or thirty thou on your part, and you set your tolerance to half a thou, you're basically you know you're locking that tool path into to wobble. You know that's what your tolerance is. It's the movement of a line in a straight line. It's allowed to go a half a thou in either direction. But if you were to change that to five thou but you're leaving 15 to 30 thou, even if you on your roughing pass were to gouge into a wall, it's only going to gouge in five thou. So you still have 10 thou kind of protecting your part back there. Um, so a lot of times, and I, I could have done that to make this a little bit faster, uh, but a lot of times you start off at a half a thou, just take a zero out on your rough passes. I wouldn't do this on a finished pass, but you take one of those zeros out, drop it to five thou, and it'll compute a lot faster, but it's kind of like, you know, it's fast and loose compared to the, the normal tolerance. But yeah, eventually this thing will finish. So we'll give it a second. If you guys have any questions, that was a good time to ask. 
Uh, we got a few minutes left, so. Yeah, Eric, I'm glad you enjoyed it. This was uh, this was a good one. I actually came into this with a plan. <laughs> a lot of times I wing it. Networks, but uh, Al said he had a few things that you guys, uh, that I think he sent out in one of the emails that some of you guys might have gotten. So I wanted to cover, I think I got all the stuff he sent out. Um, other than he was talking about some new option for, um, uh, for, for the adaptive, keeping the tool down. I, I, I couldn't find it, so I gave up. Uh, so I did the rest of them. Uh, do we have probing example videos? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think they're on the site. I never did probes for this. We do have them. Um, uh, it is a training professor. It is a series of videos, though. Uh, I don't think I, I, I'm not signed in. We do have a, it's for V33. It was a whole probing thing. Um, that would, that's either, I think if you're on the advantage plan, you can watch that. I'm not sure. I'm, I broke my sign and mess it with the website a few weeks ago and I've yet to figure out how to get it back. <laughs> so I can't sign into this. Uh, that's why I'm showing you that you get all that other stuff for free. Um, but yeah, we have the, the probing video set I made. I'm not super thrilled with it. If I'm being honest, it goes through, it shows you how to use everything you need to use. Um, and it shows how to do it through Bobcad, but uh, there's there's so much more to probing than just Bobcad. You know, it's it's your machine. It's a lot of that stuff is happening at the machine. Um, so having all the right macros and stuff, that's the part that the videos. I, I went into it, but it was also like we came out with probing, and they were like, "Hey, you need to you need to go shoot some probing videos." And my experience with probes are pretty small compared to the guys that use probes every day of their lives for setting up machines. So I think I did a pretty good job, but you know, check them out. If you're, yeah, like I said, if you're on the advantage plan, you should be able to watch those. I'm pretty sure that all these videos that you see right here come with the uh, advantage plan, but yeah, as soon as I get some time, I'm, I got to finish a lathe set for our new launch pad site. And then I get to do mill and lathe for the other versions, but that'll be a little bit quicker. I want to redo the probing, but I want to do some proper, proper stuff. So for now, the best you might find, I mean, if you could watch those videos, you watch those. Al may have done something on Facebook for uh, for that. Um, so there might be something on, you know, like one of the Bobcat After Dark videos you can look for or or post it on Facebook and, and tag Al in it. And he might be able to make a video for you. Let's see if that thing finished yet. All right, it's done. So check it out. So if we go in, this is that one inch tool going in, making all the cuts. And then we go in and set up our second one. This is the three eighths. So again, it goes in, cleans up the corners, but it also cleans up this entire area back here. So there we go. Let me know if I can help with probing. I've got some constructive criticism on the capabilities to avoid. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I mean, I, I got to figure out what I want to do. I mean, I want to go full blown with it where we where we use the probe to measure a hole and then remachine. Um, but I couldn't figure that all out when I was making the videos at the time. I think I could do it now. I think there's I think there's ways of getting it to work. It takes some takes some definite um, tweaking of some things. Yeah, it's I had one guy that successfully did it, but. That was uh, like eight months ago, and I wasn't allowed to keep his part because he was DOD, so I had to had to delete it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, I'll I'll send you an email, Matt, and we will talk talk again because I do have a I have a training coming up in uh, just a few minutes, so we do have to end here shortly. Let me copy your email address, and then I'll send it right now. That that. Oh wait. Is that your email? It's info. Is that one going to go to you, Matt? Okay, cool. All right. So that one, uh, Bobcad probing stuff. All right. I just sent it to you right now. There we go. 
So that's it for today, guys. It was a pleasure. Good questions asked today. This is the kind of one I uh, I like I like teaching. You guys actually talked this time, so this was fun. Um, yeah, that's it for today. Let me end the recording.